archaeologists or biologists or anything like that. So it may seem like, well, maybe you don't have all the information necessary to make an informed choice, but the public is being asked to make this information, make this choice as well. Even though that they don't have a degree in biology or degree in archaeology or, or anything else like that. Now, I did go through the public school. I was taught evolution, and I looked at all the facts, and basically I'm just like anybody else out there. But I've had an opportunity to study both sides of the issue, to see what the, the true facts are to make that decision, and all the seminars that I do provide that information. So whether I tell it to you or whether we search it in a book or we search it on the internet, we're going to have the same information. Is this just going to be a bunch of religious beliefs posing in science? That's another good question. And uh, a lot of people, when they come to creation evolution seminars, they think that that might be the exact case. All we're going to be doing is discussing some religious beliefs posing as science, but you've got to remember this is a very controversial issue in the scientific community, in the political community, and even in the religious community. Throughout the world, this is a very, very controversial issue. So the information we discuss will all be factual. Uh, we're not going to discuss anything that's in dispute. It's all going to be very scientific. In fact, we're going to find that most evolution scientists will agree 100% with everything we discuss here. And most of the quotations you'll be seeing during the seminar are going to be coming from evolutionists. And we're going to let them speak for themselves. All the quotes are from respected scientists in their fields, uh, mostly evolutionists, as we'll find out. And we're going to be discussing scientific truths. Okay. What's our last question? How much faith do you need to believe in creation? That's a good question. Isn't it? How much faith do we need to believe in creation? We do need some faith to believe in creation, but we need more faith to believe in evolution. And really what it comes down to, you're going to find out as we go through the seminar, it takes a lot of faith believe in either one. And really what it boils down to is there is a step of faith that's involved. And a step of faith is going to have to be gone through either direction. Whether you want to choose to believe the evolution theory or whether you want to choose to believe the creation theory. So I think you'll find out by the time we get done it takes a little more leap of faith to believe in evolution than a other will to believe in creation. Okay. Now, um, before we go too far, I wanted to uh, take an opportunity to just Say a prayer together. Thank you for the fire with me. Our Heavenly Father, I want to just thank you for this opportunity to be here and to study your creation today. To study the things that you've made and the and the signs and the wonders that you've given us to understand that it is you that has created this heaven and this earth. And that uh, as creator, that you are the king, you are the ruler. And that uh, we come before you in honor and uh, humble humility to uh, to seek your presence and your guidance in this subject. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we go too far, I'm going to obviously tell you what I believe. So nobody's mistaken in thinking that I'm going to believe one thing that, uh, and have it come off to be something else. But I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, and it has everything that we need in order to live our life fully. It has all the answers we're going to need. This, this seminar is not going to try to prove the Bible through science. That would be a mistake. To try and prove that the Bible is true through scientific knowledge and through scientific theories is going to be a big problem because if we put our faith in the science and not in the Bible, what's going to happen is every time something new comes along, some new theory comes along, it's going to tell us to tell our belief, our faith in the Bible. Because our faith wasn't properly set upon the Bible itself. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use these seminars to show that the Bible has had the right answers all the time. It is a source of knowledge and it does confirm the truth. That uh, it is the Bible that we need to put our faith in, and it's science that is being proven to be true by the Bible, not the Bible being proven by science. So the, the theory of creation and the theory of evolution are definitely two theories, two concerns, two issues, and most people in the world have two different views. We call them world views, and everybody has a world view. No matter who you are, no matter where you were born, no matter what century you lived in, you're going to have a world view. It's either going to be a view of the world from a historical standpoint from the Bible, or a view of the world from a secular standpoint from science and some of the religions and science. Now, regardless of our beliefs, we're all going to be viewing the exact same world. And that's what comes to be a problem. We're seeing the exact same thing, but because of your beliefs, we come up with different conclusions. It's like wearing a pair of tinted glasses. 
And a lot, a lot of people will talk about this. And we have two main views. We have the evolution view and we have the creation view. And if I look at the world through the evolution glasses, and I look at the world through my evolutionary belief, I would look at something like the Grand Canyon and I say, wow, look how many millions of years it would have taken the whole river to parallel that entire canyon. But if I look at it from a biblical standpoint, and I look at it from Bible-based beliefs, I'll say, well, look what the flood did in just a matter of days. It's two different ways, two different conclusions to look at the exact same thing. So when we try to understand creation and evolution, we need to remember that these beliefs sometimes become very, very strong within people. And if we want to use this seminar to be able to talk with people that are more focused on evolution versus creation, we need to remember those beliefs are very strong, very embedded within their entire being. They've grown up this way. This is what they know to be true. So what we really need to do is just look at the evidence for each of you. And we got to say, this evidence here supports the view of creation. This evidence here may seem to support the view of evolution. We got to look at all the evidence and see what fits and what doesn't with each theory. And when the evidence fits, we can apply it to that theory. But if the ev evidence is contrary to that theory, we need to start looking at the theory itself as being the problem. Now, everybody has a belief based bias. And to kind of understand that a little bit, we'll just go back in history. If you go back in history, you remember that at one point in time, they thought the sun rotated around the Earth. That the sun revolved around the Earth. The Earth was the center of the solar system, and all the planets and the sun all revolved around the Earth. There were some people that started to say, maybe this isn't true. The mathematical models to try and figure out the the paths of the planets through the, through the solar system were very, very complex, very, very difficult. And then we have somebody that came out and said, you know what, there's some other ideas here. Maybe the sun isn't revolving around the Earth, but the Earth is revolving around the sun. And finally, by the time of Galileo, he observed through the telescope that this was not true. The Earth did not revolve, or sit in the center, the sun revolved around the Earth, but the sun itself was in the center of the solar system, and the Earth was revolving around it. What happened because of his statements. Anybody know? When Galileo was making these statements, he was actually forced to recant that belief by the church. And when he was recanting these beliefs, he was overheard by a friend of his saying, it doesn't matter how many times they make him say it, it doesn't make it untrue. So really what happens is Galileo was trying to say that, look, this is what we really have. This is what we see. This here's the evidence. This here's the factual data saying that Earth is revolving around the sun. But because of very strong beliefs at that time, they wouldn't believe it. They thought the Earth was the center. The Earth was the center of the universe. Everything revolved around the Earth. And he was actually forced to recant those beliefs. Now that doesn't seem to be too bad. But we also had the view that the Earth was flat. If you remember the Earth was flat, Sailors used to be afraid that if they sailed out too far into the ocean, they could fall off the ocean. That was a very common belief. But Isaiah 40, 22 had always told them, that he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. So even before we understood that the earth was a globe, was round, the Bible had shown us that. Long before the sailors ever came to figure it out for themselves. Long before Magellan. Now, we also had this belief that the uh, Earth was held up by giant turtles, by elephants or atlas. These were common beliefs back then. But we had Job 26 7 saying that the ain't the Earth upon nothing. That the Earth is not being held up by anything else. The Bible was showing us the truth of science long before science ever figured it out. So when we're looking through the seminars and we're going through this stuff, we need to remember we're not trying to prove the Bible true but we're allowing the Bible to show us what's true in science. And we put the Bible as a basis of the belief. Now, this is all old stuff, but it isn't all that old. If we take a look back a little bit later in the history, we have a person in Enos Semmelweis. You ever heard of Enos? Anybody here has ever heard of Enos Semmelweis? He made a great contribution to the medical community. A very great contribution. In fact, just the possibility of living through surgery and living through childbearing or childbirth was greatly improved because of his um, his practices that he put into place or tried to put into place. Now, to get a little understanding of who Enos was, we'll talk a little bit about him. 
Ignis was a head resident at the Vienna General Hospital's maternity ward. Now the problem was Vienna had a, had a uh, high mortality rate in the maternity ward. It was actually 10% or higher. You notice the mortality rates were averaging 10% or higher at that maternity ward based upon a midwife clinic that was just down the street. And street births were only around 4%. So the mortality rate for a street birth, someone who never even made it into the hospital, had a better chance of living, or if someone gone to the midwife clinic had a better chance of living than going to the hospital itself. Now, as a head resident for the uh, maternity ward, that's a big problem. See, at the time, the Vienna Hospital would admit um, ladies that were ready to give birth on certain days of the week. And other days of the week, they were sent to the midwife clinic. The midwife clinic would only admit on certain days, and the hospital would only admit on certain days. Ladies would actually be begging to be allowed to go to the midwife clinic instead of the hospital. And they'd be refused, and they'd be brought into the hospital because they were worried about dying. They were worried about dying in childbirth. And actually, it was after childbirth that, that where they were dying. And a lot of times, they would just become so slow or not try to tell anybody that they were in labor for such a long period that they were able to give birth before they ever reached the hospital. Because they had a better chance of living. Now he needed to figure out what was wrong. Why the hospital mortality rates were so much higher. So he started looking around a little bit and he found out that there was only one difference between the midwife clinic and the hospital as far as delivering babies. And all the midwives would wash their hands between each delivery. But the doctors but maybe examining person that had recently died, uh, trying to figure out the cause of death, and from there they would go to the next lady that came in to give birth, and they would deliver the baby with them without well, like, washing their hands. And we know today that's a big problem with germs and bacteria. This was before the time was. So this was before the time of understanding bacteria or anything else like that. And just didn't understand that there was bacteria that was being transferred that were causing these death, these, uh, these uh, post-delivery deaths. But, he did understand that that was the one difference. He's seen the actual data saying that the only difference between the midwife clinic and the hospital is they all wash their hands, the doctors wouldn't. So he advocated that all the doctors wash their hands between visits of each patient. You know what the result was? He was ridiculed. In fact, he was ridiculed by the entire medical community to the point where he was dismissed and he was sent to a mental institution or advocating those doctors wash their hands. See, the doctors were saying that they should never have to worry about washing their hands, that it could be impossible for them to be the cause of these deaths, and they were very, very offended because of their beliefs. It wasn't because of any scientific data, it was because of a belief bias. They were looking at the world through their beliefs. So, Amos Semmelweis was actually sent to a mental, mental institution two weeks after he was at that mental institution, he was stabbed by another patient. The doctor that took care of that injury didn't bother to wash his hands, and he died two weeks later of an infection. Exact same reason that he was trying to get, get them to stop killing people by infection to wash their hands was the reason that he was killed. So, does that still happen today, though? Let's take a look at just a few years back. Here's a USA Today article, December 1st, 2009. This was back when uh, some hackers got into one of the university computers and started going through a bunch of email on global warming. This is what USA Today said, in a long string of embarrassing email exchanges, CRU scientists discussed with friendly outside colleagues, including Penn State University's Michael Mann, how to manipulate the data they want to show the world, how to hide the awful flawed data they don't. In one exchange, they discussed the trick of how to hide the decline in global temperatures since the 1960s. Again and again, the researchers don't just object to inconvenient truths, but also inconvenient truth tellers. They contemplate and orchestrate efforts to purge scientists and journals who won't sing the same global warming cable. Does it sound like a belief taking over science? It's exactly what was happening in the USA of the Bay Area. Now, a survey was also done with scientists, and the survey that uh, was done by uh, the question was how many scientists fabricate falsified research, systematic review and then analysis, survey data. From plus one, it says on average across the surveys, around 2% of scientists admitted they fabricated. In other words, they made up 
falsified or altered data to improve the outcome at least once, and up to 34% admitted to other questionable research practices, including failing to present data that contradict one's own previous research, and dropping observations or data points from analysis based on a depth field they were incorrect. So these scientists have actually admitted that they either made up data, and 34% admitted that they omitted data that didn't uphold their research. If they had seen data that they were examining contrary to their theories, they ignored it. Now, when asked about the behavior of their colleagues, 14% knew someone who had fabricated, falsified, or altered data, and 72% knew someone who had committed other questionable research practices. That's the meaning of data. The uh, dropping of observation or data points based on gut feelings, based upon in non-agreement to their own theory. Scientists still do that today? They very much do. In fact, they admit it to themselves. That uh, they'll actually drop data that doesn't agree with their theories. There is a belief bias that is in everybody's eyes. And it's very hard to remove that belief bias from your eyes. So what it really boils down to is we need to understand what true science is and what religious beliefs are. And here's what science actually is. Now, we're going to do a little Science 101 class, so don't worry, it'll be pretty painless. We're not going to get into any big quizzes or tests or anything. But we need to know what science is. And the definition of science is it's a knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method. So it's a knowledge or system of knowledge covering general truths or general laws. Science is about truth and laws. That's what science really is. And all this information is obtained and tested through what we call the scientific method. So here's what the scientific method is. It's really a four-part process. They say a scientific method is a body of techniques for investigating phenomena, acquiring new knowledge, or correcting and integrating previous knowledge. To be termed scientific, the method of inquiry must be based on gathering observable, empirical, and measurable evidence subject to specific principles of reasoning. Scientific method consists of the collection of data through observation and experimentation and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. What they're saying is scientific method is gathering concrete data that we can measure, we can observe, and we can repeat over and over again. It's a four-step process. Here's what the process is. First of all, is use your experience. That's step one of the scientific method. Consider the problem, try to make sense of it. This is the point where we come up with what we call a theory. That's step two. So we look at a problem, or we look at something we see in the world today. Say we look outside the window and we see all these trees. We say, wow, how the trees get here? So we keep on looking, and everywhere we go, we see trees, and now the trees are all coming out of the dirt. So that's what step one is, just looking at the problem and trying to make sense of it, saying, how do these trees get here? Then we go to step two. Step two is to form a hypothesis, in other words, form a theory. A theory is nothing more than a guess. It is nothing to be considered true. It's not a law. It's not light and stone. It's just a guess, period. It's trying to explain the problem. So we look at all these trees. We see them all coming out of the dirt. And we say, my theory is trees come from dirt. I don't see them coming out of the middle of the concrete. I don't see them coming out of the buildings. But I do see them coming out of the dirt. So my theory is trees come from dirt. So now we have our theory, we have our guess. So we go to step three, and we deduce a prediction from that hypothesis. In other words, we try to predict what would happen if my theory is true. So if I assume that the theory is true, what consequences would follow? Well, what would happen if I wait around long enough and I know all the right conditions, sun, water, then I should see more trees growing from the dirt. That would be my prediction. Now, Here's where the problem comes in. People start looking at this prediction and they say, this would be true. And if I wait around long enough, I start seeing more trees growing up. 20 years down the road, 40 years down the road, I have this patch of land sitting out there, and I never touch it. I let it go. It rains. Sun goes down on it. Years go by, and new trees start coming up. Eventually, 40 years down the road, I've got some nice little trees growing up, and I say, my theory is true. Trees come from there. And that's the problem today, is most scientists stop right here. They say, if we can predict, 
if our theory was true, what would be the result? They see that result and they say, see, my theory is proven true. They never go to step four. Step four is to test it. To look for the opposite of each consequence in order to disprove number two. So step four is to try to prove your theory false. They don't want to do that to me. So what I would do with that is I would try everything I could to prove that theory false. What I would do is I'd take a big patch of dirt, I would sift it, I would clean it, I'd make sure there's nothing but dirt. I'd put it in a spot where it can get sunlight, where I can get it water, but it can't get anything else into that pile of dirt. And I wait for the tree to grow. Will the tree ever grow? I need a seed, don't I? And that would prove my theory to be false. But if I didn't go to that step and I didn't try to prove it wrong, I'm going to assume that theory is true, and that's what we see today so often with science, is we try to prove the theory is true, but they never try to prove it false. That can be a big, big problem. There's a reason for it. Just like these scientists that are falsifying data or emitting data points, there's a reason for it. Because when it contradicts us the theory, it causes a big problem with their job. If we take a look at science right now, when we look at a university professor, Typically, they have to apply for grants, for funding, for a research project. When they receive this funding for this research project, they will present their hypothesis, their theory. And they'll say, this is a theory that I'm going to try and prove. And they'll receive funding to prove this theory true. Now, they got a 10-year grant. In the first year of that grant, they start seeing evidence that it's false. What's going to happen if they present that back to the board saying, we have evidence contrary to this theory. Do you think that grant money will continue to go to that theory? Will they waste another nine years worth of money on something that's going to be proven false? Or will they just, you know what, I'm going to either start over from square one and have absolutely nothing, or I can just ignore that little bit of data and keep on going. It's about a job, it's about security, and a lot of times it's about prestige, a lot of times it's about pride. You don't want to be proven wrong, you don't want to be admitting that we're wrong today. We have the idea of having a job here. If all your theories are false and proven false, who's going to give you money anymore? So, so we have a lot of problems. But some scientists actually didn't feel that way. In fact, we have Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, if we look at Albert Einstein, he had a lot of theories out there. A lot of his theories are not able to be proven true, just like the theory of evolution, just like the theory of creation. We cannot prove it true because we cannot repeat the event, we cannot measure it. We cannot repeat it over and over and observe it to be true. We were never there to observe it to begin with. A lot of Einstein's theories were based upon that. It was something that could not be proven to be true, but he understood the scientific method very well. He said himself, no amount of experimentation can ever prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. See, the fact lies, if you find something contrary to your theory, you throw away your theory. Albert Einstein understood that. Step four means you try to prove your theory wrong. If you find anything contrary to it, toss the theory out. He said one experiment can prove his theory wrong, but an experiment will never prove the truth because these are things that could not be repeated, could not be done over and over again. So we're going to take a look at three different theories. Now that we got the science out of the way, we can start looking at the actual evidence. So let's look at the three different theories. Now these theories are belief. Not a single one has been proven to be true. These are all based on beliefs. All these theories, there is no direct observable evidence to support any one of these theories. This is all based upon just data that's out there. So this is something that we cannot go back. We cannot recreate the event. We cannot recreate the universe. And I don't think there's anybody here that really wants to try. <laughs> so, um, usually that means we have to destroy the existing one. So I don't think anybody's going to try to recreate the universe. But we can't observe the event itself. We can't repeat the event, so we can't have actual proof that the theory is true and becomes law. So all these are just mainly theories. They're beliefs. They're guesses. Now we have the evolution theory. Believes in there was a big bang. And that happened about 14.6 billion years ago, I think, right now. The universe was, was uh, formed through this big bang process 12, 15 billion years ago. I just put 12 to 15 up there because it changes all the time. Sometimes it's 14.6, sometimes it's 16, sometimes it's 14. It kind of varies, and I think today it's like 14.6 or 14.8. 
Then we have what we call theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is believed that God created the universe, but he used evolution to do it. It says the universe came about by the Big Bang, and it happened about 14.6 billion years ago, but God started it and just set things in motion, let evolution take its course. What's the difference between those two theories? They're both basically the evolution theory. One just says in the beginning was a bang, and the other says in the beginning God made a bang. That's the only difference between those two. So really we've got just one theory up on the board right now. And the other theory is the theory of creation. It's a Bible-based theory. It says that 6,000 years ago, God formed the heavens and the earth, and he created it in six literal days. I'm going to tell you both of these are theories. Whether we look at evolution, whether we look at creation, it is a theory because we cannot prove it scientifically to be true. So what we need to do is look at all the evidence. And when we look at the evidence, we'll see what fits with what theory, and we know which theory is possible. Now, both of these are religious beliefs. Evolution is much of a religion as creation is. And when people start to realize that evolution truly is a religion, it sets things back on the level plane. In fact, let's take a look at Michael Roos, professor of philosophy and zoology at the University of Gulf Canada. It says, evolution is promoted by its practitioners. It's more than a mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning. It is true of evolution until the day. Evolution, therefore, came into being as kind of secular ideology, an explicit substitute for Christianity. Evolution is a religion. So we're talking about two religions now. We're talking about two theories, two beliefs, both require faith. Now we're on a level playing field. So now we can look at the scientific data and we can see what the Bible shows to be true. So to understand this, we really need to understand when we look at the age of things, when we look at all the other things, we look at scientific data, we need to understand something, some simple logical steps. Best way to describe how to understand this is scuba diving. I know it seems a little odd, but let's say we're going to go to scuba diving and we find a shipwreck. And we find this shipwreck and we start looking at the ship and we look at the wood and we look at the materials that are on the ship. How would we determine when the ship sank? Well, we can say we can examine the wood, we can examine the design of the ship, and we say the design of the ship is from the late 1600s, 1680, 1690s. So it probably sank sometime after that, right? It wouldn't have sank before it was designed. So that's the first logical step we take. And I'll say we find some artifacts that we pull up, you know, some silverware, flatware, whatever it might be, maybe some pots and bands, things like that. And these were artifacts that were commonly used around the 17, early 1700s, 1700, 1710. So we can say the ship probably sank around 1700, 1710, somewhere in that area. It's pretty close. But then let's say we find a treasure chest. And we bring that treasure chest on the land, and we open up the treasure chest, and we see all these coins inside this treasure chest. We start looking at the coins. We find one that's 1695, find another one from 1710, and we find another one from 1750. What did the ship say? Anybody got an idea? There we go. We got a word. Sometime after 1750, right? Even though we believe that ship might have sank around 1700 or 1710, we have evidence saying it couldn't have possibly sank before that. We have coins made in 1750 in that ship. And that's what we need to look for. We need to look for evidence that says the universe cannot be created before this certain time. And when we find that evidence, we can start narrowing down the dates of the universe. So let's look at the evolution theory, the Big Bang. Now, the evolution theory says that the matter all started out as a simple little plus, teeny small dot. All matter in the universe at one point was at a little teeny dot, a period at the end of the sentence. That small little period at the end of the sentence, it blew up. And it expanded out, creating space and creating time. But what this theory says is that if we have this explosion, this expansion of matter that's going out and forward, we're going to have a universe with no center. And that's very key to the evolution theory, that they have a universe that has no center. There's no special place in the universe either. They liken it to taking and putting balloon pennies to a balloon. Let's say we blew a whole bunch of pennies to a balloon, and they're all sitting there one little big mass, and we blow up the balloon. As the balloon gets big, the pennies go up further away. That's the Big Bang Theory. So all the pennies are going out, there's nothing in the middle. And that's what the evolution theory says, the Big Bang, 
is all the things going out, all the matter going out, nothing in the center of the universe. That's very, very common. Now, what we should see as a result is all the matter should be evenly distributed. Say, if we take a little firecracker and we make an explosion, we got a little dirt around it or something like that, it's going to spread the dirt evenly all the way around it as it spreads it out. So, if we Big Bang were clear, true, we should see this evenly distributed matter. But, instead, it's lumpy. There are clusters of stars and great voids. What we see and what we observe, uh, based on the evolution theory of the Big Bang theory, is contrary. We have the Big Bang theory saying that we should have an even distribution of matter all centered around the outside of the galaxy. We can stand in any one spot in the galaxy and we look out and pretty much see the same thing. And then we have what we actually see is this lumpy universe. We have great big areas of galaxies and then nothing. Absolutely nothing in between. There's something else though. With the Big Bang Theory, we have to figure out why everything's spinning. You ever looked out into the universe? You see stars and you see planets and everything else. And when they look at it, they see everything spinning. Our Earth is spinning, isn't it? And as our Earth spins, it rotates around the sun. So now the Earth is rotating around the sun. So it's spinning, and it's spinning around the sun. The sun itself is spinning, and the moon is spinning. And the moon is spinning while it spins around the Earth, while it spins around the sun. And all the other planets are spinning while it spins around the sun. In fact, our entire solar system is spinning within our galaxy. And our entire galaxy is spinning. And all the other galaxies are spinning. And they're trying to figure out how can this be. There's only one explanation. It's called the law of angular, law of conservation of angular momentum. Now, this is a physical law. If you, if, you ever, if you study physics, the law of conservation of angular momentum is a fact. It's been proven. We can observe it. We can repeat it over and over again. In fact, you can repeat it yourself. So we look out in the universe and we see everything in the universe is spinning. And they're trying to figure out why. Well, the only result, the only possibility is that that little ball of matter, remember that ball of matter in that one little period that gave no sense, that little size, but little teeny dot of matter, if that were spinning when it exploded, when it expanded out, that everything coming off would spin because of the long angular momentum. So we have this law of conservation of angular momentum that says that if something's spinning, anything that comes off it has to spin as well. Real simple experiment. Now you guys can try this. You may not want to try it when it's really cold outside, but you could if you really wanted to. I'd suggest waiting until spring. Take a bucket of water. Anybody ever taken a bucket of water and swung it around and around over your head? You ever done that? It's a lot of fun, ain't it? Does the water stay in the bucket or does it come out when it gets above? It usually stays in the bucket, doesn't it? That's based upon something called centrifugal force. Now, centrifugal force says that the force that, that water is experiencing, everything that's rotating around that pivot point wants to go out, straight out, straight away. And that centrifugal force is pushing that water up into the bottom of the bucket, and it's stronger than the force of gravity trying to pull it back down here. So the water stays in the bucket. Now, keep that bucket spinning, and let go. And then you let go of that bucket, that bucket's going to take off straight off in the direction you let go. Okay, let go. This is the road. But something happens to the bucket. The bucket itself starts to spin. That's the law of conservation of angular momentum. Anything that comes off a spinning object will spin itself in the same direction. So when you let go of that bucket, it starts spinning as it goes through the air and water starts flying all over the place. The law of angular momentum says that. So when we look at the universe today, what do we see? Everything is spinning. Just like the Big Bang Theory, the law of conservation of angular momentum says it should, except three of our planets. We have three different planets in our own solar system that are spinning backwards. Now, that's a problem. Because the law of conservation of angular momentum says everything should spin in the same direction of the object it came off of. And if everything came off of this ball of matter that was spinning, then everything should spin in that same direction. So they're trying to figure out why these planets are spinning backwards as opposed to the other planets. Now, if we take a look at some of the theories, they talk about Venus a little bit. They said, well, maybe it's possible that Venus, when it came into orbit, that it got close to the Earth, and the gravitational pull between Earth and Venus caused it to start spinning backwards. But they haven't been able to prove that theory. It says we have some theories about how the spin of Venus may have been holding the same with Earth, 
Fortunately, they don't really work. At least not yet. They had some other thoughts that maybe it was asteroids that helped from these planets, and these random hits by asteroids over billions of years slowed the rotation of the planet down and started spinning it backwards. So they took some models and they ran them into the, some, some, ran some computer models on this to test it out, and the results were not very appealing. Every time they ran these computer model results, they started helping these planets with asteroids, and they simulated billions of years worth of being helped with asteroids, and the best they were ever able to do is to slow down the planet, they were never able to get it spinning backwards. They started hitting it with larger and larger asteroids, trying to achieve backward spinning of the planet, all they ever did was destroy the planet they were trying to spin. So the asteroid theory didn't work anyway. But besides the planets, we got some other problems. We have eight moons that are rotating backwards. In fact, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons out for rotating up in both directions. But, even if we can explain the rotation of the moons going backwards, contrary to, to the law of conservation of angular momentum, or the planets spinning backwards, contrary to this law, we have another problem. Some galaxies are actually spinning backwards. In fact, CNN had this article, a galaxy captured by the camera of the Hubble Space Telescope seems to be rotating in the direction opposite of what it should. Astonished astronomers announced this week. Why were they astonished? Because it should be impossible for a galaxy to spin contrary to the law of conservation of angular momentum. If the Big Bang Theory were true, it's not possible for that galaxy to spin backwards. They continue on, NGC 4622, which is the galaxy, suggests there may be people do not know all there is to know. A closer inspection reveals another enigma, a trailing inner arm that wraps around the galaxy in the opposite direction of its rotation. Well, in spite of all of this, there's still one major question to ask. When we're looking at the origin of the universe, the Big Bang Theory, we have to ask, where did that come from? Where did that matter come from to begin with? Now that is a legitimate question, and a lot of people like to say, when we're talking with evolutionists, they're going to want to say, evolution is going to say, the matter was just there. And if you invoke God saying, God is the one who created the matter, then that's not, that's not science, that's religion. But remember, we already put this on the same basis. These are both religions, these are both faith-based beliefs. They're not true in any way, shape, or form, according to the scientific theory, scientific method. So where does matter come from? What created matter does not? We take a look at here, we have uh, Alan Booth from the Scientific American, May 1984. The observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region, in other words, a dot. It is then attempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Now how much more scientific is that than saying in the beginning? They're saying, in the beginning, nothing became something and created our universe. They're saying nothing created it, and we're saying God created it. So there's two religious beliefs. Now, what does the evidence actually show? Now, although it is possible, physics tells us that it is possible to create matter from energy. Remember Einstein's theory, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times a constant. The constant happens to be the speed of light squared, such a huge number, which means that if we have a whole lot of energy, we can make a little teeny bit of matter. Now, physics tells us that we can actually do that. You can actually create matter from energy. However, the problem is, when we create matter from energy, we create just as much antimatter as we do matter. And that becomes a big problem for the big bang theory because antimatter and matter cannot exist side by side. If they contact each other, they destroy each other very violently. If we had the same amount of antimatter and matter being created at the same spot, the same place, and then this creation of this infinitesimal region that they're talking about, it would immediately destroy itself. And what we actually observe when we look at the uh, matter and antimatter in the universe, we see a lot of matter, but we see extremely small amounts of antimatter. Nothing that would, ex would explain energy creating matter. Something else had to create the matter, not energy. Because there is no antimatter to go with it. And that antimatter itself would have destroyed the universe as fast as it created. So, yet another problem with the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory, according to the Big Bang Theory itself, that energy created matter says that the Big Bang Theory itself says the universe can't exist. So, it's a huge problem for the evolution theory. 
or we can go on and we can come a little bit closer to home right now and we can start talking about the sun itself. Remember the treasure chest? We're trying to see some dates here. We never really talked about any dates yet. What we talked about to this point was just whether or not the Big Bang Theory can be true or not. We see a lot of evidence contrary to the Big Bang Theory saying we should probably set it aside. So let's take a look at the age of the sun. Now we know that the sun produces energy by thermal nuclear fusion. In other words, hydrogen turns into helium, helium goes into the next step and the next step and eventually works its way to iron. Now if we were to look at the core of the sun, as the sun grows older, any star grows older, more thermal nuclear fusion takes place and we get brighter and brighter and brighter. And the sun or a star grows brighter and brighter with age. Now, if the sun is growing brighter with age, the core of the sun should alter. And that would mean that if the sun is 4.6 billion years old, just like the evolution theory states, it should have brightened up by about 40%. Now this is based on the evolution theory's calculations and everything else. If the sun is 4.6 billion years old, it should be 40% brighter now than it was when it formed 4.6 billion years ago. So let's take a look at the temperature of the Earth. The Earth's average temperature right now is around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you look at it year by year by year, summer and winter, every location on the planet, we average it all out, we average about 59 degrees Fahrenheit from the average temperature of the Earth. It's not a bad position, you know, thinking about the poles, although it is on the poles, based on the equator, we get that average of 59 degrees. Now, let's say just a 25% increase in the brightness of the sun. Why are we only going back 25%? instead of 40% over 4.6 billion years old? Because if we go back to about 3 billion years is when evolution says life should have formed. About 3 billion years ago, evolution theory says life should form on the Earth. So we'll go back 3 billion years. In other words, a 25% change in the brightness of the sun. A just a 25% increase in brightness increases the average temperature another 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we go back to around 3, 3.5 billion years ago, when life was merged, that's 25% change in the sun. So, taking no simple math, if the Earth's average daily temperature is 59 degrees Fahrenheit, the average temperature of the Earth is 59, and we take out that 25% increase going back to 3.5 billion years, we take out 32 degrees out of the average daily temperature, which means the average temperature of the Earth at the time life was supposed to be evolving is below. In other words, now we have a frozen planet that cannot form life. So now we're putting another limit on the age of the Earth, or the age of the planet, or the age how long life has been around. It couldn't have been around 3.5 million years from now. We would have had a frozen ball of mass. Speaking of frozen balls of mass, we have comets. You know what a comet is, right? Big, dirty ice cube. That's the best way to look at it. You get a pile of dirt, you get a whole bunch of ice, throw it through the air, that's a comet. <laughs> And if you've got circling around the sun, then we have what we would consider a comet in the night sky. Now we have two types of comets. We have what we call short period comets. They circle the sun every 200 years or less. And then we have long period comets that circle the sun every 200 years or more. So a short period comets, they say, are losing material and have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years. See, every time they go around the sun, the sun burns off a lot of the ice there. That's why we have a tail to the comet. Every time we see it going around the sun. It's losing its mass. So these short period comets that are circling the Earth every 200 years, or circling the Sun every 200 years or less, have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years. So, if the four solar system is 4.6 billion years old, how can we still have comets today? It's a good question, isn't it? Now, when that question is posed to the evolution theory, it says, why do we still have comets? They say, well, there's something called the Oort cloud. See, the long period comets, these are the comets that, ex that circle the Earth every 200 years or more, they circle the Sun every 200 years or more, are replaced by something called the Oort cloud. Long period comets are supposed to be replaced by this Oort cloud. Now, the Oort cloud is very far out in space. No one has ever seen it. It, they said it's far enough out in space that we can't actually see it with any of our telescopes. There's absolutely no evidence that it exists, none at all. And the hypothetical Oort cloud, by their own account, does not have enough mass to last 4.6 billion years old. If it had enough mass to be even surviving for 4.6 billion years, we should have been able to see it with our telescopes today. 
But they say, they can't see it, we have no evidence that it even exists. Isn't that something like that religion? I don't know it's there. I can't see that it's there. I have no evidence that it exists, but I'm going to believe it's there. And that's basically the definition of a religion. In fact, we can take some quotes. Here's uh, Carl Sagan himself. The many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort Club, its properties, its origin, and its evolution, yet there's not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. What Carl Sagan is saying here is that they're writing scientific papers about the Oort Club, what's like, what it does, everything else about it, but there's not a single shred of evidence that it even exists. And yet we see all these papers filling the, filling the journals. We have another quote. Timothy Ferris, the whole shebang. Though the Oort Club has yet to be observed, the theory accounts so well for the distribution of comets orbits that most astronomers today accept its existence. That's a declaration of faith. The Oort Club of Comets is an example of belief without proof or observation. So we have this long period of comets that are being replaced by something we can't see and we don't know exists. What about short period comets? The ones that are 200 years or less, the ones that should have been gone after 10,000 years? <coughs> They say these come from what we call the Kuiper Belt. Now, the Kuiper Belt is a region in space that exists right around the Neptune area. Now, this has been observed. This does exist. There's a problem with it, though. A typical comet is about 10 kilometers in diameter. That's what a typical comet's mass is. But the Kuiper Belt objects, are about 600 of them have been discovered as of 2002, and they're usually from 100 to 500 kilometers in diameter. So they're anywhere from 10 times to 50 times larger than an average comet. So if we ever seen a Kuiper Belt object coming in and going around the sun and coming back out, it'd be a site that would be so large that it would have been written every single historical document you would ever seen. And yet there's not a single bit of evidence ever suggesting there was ever a comet in the history of this Earth that day. So these Kuiper Belt objects, we've never seen any of these come in to make a pass around the sun. They're all sitting just floating somewhere out in the Neptune region. Now, the largest comet ever <coughs> observed was Comet Kalok in 1997 and diameter 40 kilometers. 40, not 500. So, what do the scientists say about this? The existence of the Kuiper Belt and the arc cloud of comets has not been verified. Perhaps there's an alternative. The presence of comets may be evidence that the solar system is not as old as it's often assumed. Remember those coins in the treasure chest? If we had a coin from 1750, it couldn't have been sunk before 1750, right? If we have comets that can't exist for more than 10,000 years, should our solar system be, have been around for more than 10,000 years? So we have evidence stating that the solar system is less than 10,000 years old. So we should be able to throw the theory of a 4.6 billion year old solar system called window. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit now that we've come down to the age of the universe itself. We're going to take a look at the age of the Earth real quick. Now, to take a look at the age of the Earth, we're going to relook at the theories again. Remember these theories were beliefs, and uh, these theories are as much scientific, one as the other. Whether well, it's evolution or creation, they have as much scientific standing as, as either one of them. Now one is a religion, one is a belief, or one is science, one is a religion. They're both science, they're both religion. So evolution says the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. Chemical life came about 3.5, 3.6. I think right now it's about 3.1 billion years ago. Mankind came around, I should say 1 billion years ago. I think I'm going to type one. So, and then we have the theistic evolution. It says the Genesis 6 days were not literal days. The day age theory, they have the gap theory, they have all these other different theories to agree completely with the evolution theory. And they say that God created man through evolution. So in other words, what God did is he had all these beings dying and dying and dying and dying before sin was ever introduced to the earth. And then he finally created man. And actually, if we take a look at the Catholic Church, standing on evolution, said that when God, when evolution came to the point of man being formed, is when God said, this is man, and gave him an immortal soul. So in other words, God let all this dying and death occur. And then, when we reached man, he gave him an immortal soul. So we see a big problem with what the Bible states and what the evolution theory says. They're completely opposed to each other. And then we got the creation theory that they're 6,000 years old and God created it in six literal days. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus a little bit on the evolution model. 
And we're going to see if these dates actually hold up in any way, shape, or form. So by looking at the evolution model, we have the 15 billion years ago the Earth exploded into existence, which we've already covered. Well, 4.6 billion years ago the Earth evolved, which we can already have shown that the solar system couldn't have existed that long because of the comets. Well, 3.6 billion years ago life evolved and humans evolved from these eight like creatures. So, what it takes? A lot of time, a lot of chance, and a lot of natural processes. Now, some of the strongest argument, arguments that evolution states for the age of the Earth is from what we call the geologic column. Have you ever heard of the geologic column? The geologic column is where we get all of our fossils from. Now, it's evidence that the Earth is billions of years old. In fact, you'll see this geological column in almost any single textbook on science that you see out there, especially in the public school system. We have all these different periods, and there are these layers of rock, layers of rock, layers of rock. But did you know that column does not exist anywhere in the world? Only in the textbook. There's never been a complete geologic column found anywhere in the world. There have been columns that have lots of missing layers. There have been columns that have been found that have layers upside down. So in other words, they find a Devonian period, Devonian layer 360 to 410 million years ago, on top of a Jurassic layer from over 140 million years ago. Saying that the Jurassic layer was older than the other with the exact opposite of what the column is supposed to be. We see these mixed up columns and we see these missing columns, but then we have something that's interesting in the geologic column. There's something that does have scientific evidence. And that's what we call the KP boundary. It's right between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period. It's where the mass extinctions took place. This is where evolution says there must have been a type of a asteroid or something. Can you pause a minute so I can change the disc? <laughs> so what we really have, what we've, what we've dealt with so far, and just give us a little bit of 